try and guess when we're live. <laughs> you can tell we're figuring it out as we go, but. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> All right, I, I think we might be live now. So everyone, welcome to a and Commerce. Today's very exciting because we have our physics education folks with us and some really exciting things going on, uh, which I'm delighted to share. But first, before we get started, I'd love all of you uh, to introduce yourself. So Robin, tell me who you are and why you're here. Um, hi, I'm Robin Locke. I'm an associate professor of physics and astronomy here at a and Commerce. I am a physics education researcher and I do a lot of projects to increase um, the quality and quantity of high school physics teachers and um, just to improve physics education in general. Excellent. William. Hi, uh, I'm an associate professor in physics and astronomy too. Um, I also do physics education research and uh, astrophysics research. Um, and likewise, my, uh, one of my big passions is, uh, uh, is improving the quality and, uh, and the support that we give to high school teachers, especially local high school teachers. Fantastic. And Melanie? Hi, I'm Melanie Fields. Um, I'm an assistant professor in curriculum and instruction. I'm also the director of Leo Teach, which is the pathway for becoming a secondary STEM teacher, high school seven through 12. And um, it is my job to support each of the departments as they send them over to CNI for all of their pedagogy. Fantastic. Well, I know a little enough about you to know that all of you have some uh, global recognition about the great work that you do and you're doing now. And so part of me is wondering, why a and Commerce? Why are you choosing to do this great work here in rural Northeast Texas? Um, well, I am a native Texan. Um, I am from the Houston area. Um, and one thing I love about our university is, so before I came here, I was always at those very, very large universities that had 50,000 students here at a and Commerce. We have a small enough community, we have small enough classes that we can really support all of our students, especially the ones who need it the most, our first generation college students, um, our students who you know are working 40 hours a week and raising kids while they're coming to school. And I really feel like um, we can make the biggest difference at a university like this one. Um, I agree. Well, I, I'm sorry, go on, Melanie. That's okay. I'm going to bounce off what she said. Um, native Texan. Um, I've lived in this area for about 25 years. My kids go to rural Texas schools and I want the best in this area. So I want to support our university in providing and promoting and making the best. So, and I know Bill's going to bounce off the two of you. I can tell by that accent. You're also native Texan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, so I'm originally from um, a uh, town called Lytham St. Tans on the northwest coast of England. Um, I actually uh, came to A&M Commerce originally as a postdoc um, because we actually, we have a lot of really amazing people in our physics department. I came here because one of our professors, Dr. Dr. Baran Lee is a leading uh, researcher in nuclear astrophysics. So he I knew about him before I came here, um, before I knew about a and Commerce. So I came here for that reason. And when I was here, I began to get invested in, when I began teaching, I became invested in our students and I became, I became involved with teaching teachers and saw um, how much we could do to help the, the teachers in our area. Um, and so I just got became I became increasingly passionate about helping them out and getting everyone involved in in uh, understanding how amazing physics is. Wonderful. Well, I understand that there is a critical shortage of physics teachers in our schools, um, not only here in rural Northeast Texas, but across the nation and, and perhaps globe. Talk to me a little bit about why that's the case. First, why, why is there a shortage? And then we'll get to go to why that matters. But why, do, why is there a shortage to begin with? Well, a lot of people don't see teaching as an appealing profession. Um, we hear about how teachers don't get paid enough. 
which is true. They certainly deserve more, but we do still, you know, they, they make a decent living. Um, we hear about how stressful their jobs are, and that's true, but everybody's job is stressful. Um, one thing that might be part of it for physics in particular is because there simply are not a lot of people getting degrees in physics. You'll look at engineering in the United States, there's 100,000 students getting bachelor's degrees in engineering every year. There's 100,000 getting degrees in biology every year. There's 8,000 getting degrees in physics every year. There are not a lot of physicists, period. And um, that's worrisome in itself because physics is the source of so many of the amazing technologies that we use today. Mm -hmm. Melanie, can you talk to us a little bit about what made if someone decides they want to be a physics teacher, um, how that path may be more challenging than other paths um, to get a degree? Well, first, just the path to getting, um, so I'm gonna bounce off Robin again. Um, often they think, oh, I, I can't balance getting a degree in physics plus teaching because that's what it looks like on paper. It looks like, and because that's what we do, because we value, especially in secondary, we value the, the core degree in your chosen field, whether it's math, biology, chemistry, or physics. We value that because they have to have that content knowledge to be able to, they have to know it up one side and down the other to even convey it to kids to get them on fire for it. Um, and so physics degree looks hard on paper. I mean, that's pure and simple. A math degree, even from, I mean, from anywhere, but all of our degrees are challenging. And then you add teaching, you add this, now we have to go teach it. And in our program, which is also very unique, we start those early field experiences in their junior year, they get to go teach and, and try out their skills. So over in the uh, science and math departments, they're teaching them all of their content. And then I'm like, okay, now we're gonna go make these lessons and learn the pedagogy. And it almost sounds scary, but, but once we do it, this brilliant thing happens and the passion just, it starts showing, they get so excited. And so we introduce it early enough to give them a chance, I hate to say it, an escape. Usually I hook them, we hook them, this group of fine people that we work so closely together with, we hook them early in their junior year. They stay with us, they see it through, they get all of these different experiences in the field, even before they even student teach and they stay or they can realize early, this isn't for me. And that's a really unique thing about Texas a and Commerce is that we have this program that they can learn early on and still get their physics degree. We don't lose them out of that. They get hooked over there. I mean, you can tell by these two, they're not leaving them. Um, but if they do figure out that teaching is not for them, we'd rather them do it now than get to the field and burn out early because we have not only a shortage, but our attrition rate um, is really high after about three or four years in the STEM Specifically field. Specifically in physics or across the board for teaching? In all STEM, if they have it. However, not ours. In the six years that I've been here, hmm. our retention in the field at five years is about 85%. Really? Yeah, because we, we do these cool things. I mean, like I said, they get to meet Dr. Noon and Dr. Locke and me. And we get them really, we get them really connected into the community, into teaching early, and and then they go on and get master's degrees, and they're coming back to see us, and then then we have this network. So I need to stop because it's not just me, um, but it is why. I mean, it looks hard on paper, but once we help them see that we will be there for them and support them, we see them through to the end, and then we've got these amazing physics majors with teaching. It's it's really cool. So you said our retention rate in the field after one of our STEM teachers or physics teachers goes is 85%. Yes, what nice. is the typical at other schools or other programs, if you had to guess? Across the nation, um, it's more like 30 and 40%. Wow. Okay. So no wonder you have global recognition. This is making sense. Yeah. Um, so we know it's, it's daunting to, to major and follow through uh, with physics education. Mm -hmm. um, why is it so important to have extraordinary physics teachers in the first place? 
why, why, why should we care? I mean, I do care, but tell me why. That's a will question. That's a will question. There you go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, uh, I mean, physics itself as a subject is, is important because it's a cornerstone of a, uh, uh, of a, you know, our technological society and many of the up and coming technologies that, uh, to you know that we need to invest in to be a successful country uh they their foundation is physics okay you know things like um alternative energies quantum computing um and so on and so forth these are all uh these are all going to be massively important over the next century right and you can't you can't do this without physics so we need we need well-trained physicists mm -hmm. in this country. And to have well-trained physicists, you need great, great physics teachers. Um, and, uh, and at the moment, we're, we aren't quite there as a nation. We are under 50% uh, of all high school physics teachers actually have a degree in physics, right? So we're, this, is, wow. this is part of the... Um, the battle that we're fighting to try and, and raise to we're trying to tackle it from two angles we're trying to increase the number of teachers of high school physics teachers with a degree in physics and then we're trying to take those existing physics teachers who don't have a degree in physics but who are really committed and passionate teachers we're trying to give them the support and the physics training um, so that they can do the job that they want to do to inspire their students. So I, I hear you tell me that 50% of physics teachers have physics degrees. Mm. What are those other degrees that they might have? It'll be life science, biology, chemistry. Even math. And Robin. Yeah, and can I just cut in, it's, last I checked it was lower than 50%. Wow. It's under 50%. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I know people who majored in English and are high school physics teachers. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like me teaching high school physics, which no one wants. I'm, I'm teaching second grade right now to my second grader and it's, I'll stick to, to my work and I'll, I'll stick to cheering you all on, on making sure we graduate more exceptional physics teachers. Now here, I have a question about that too. What's the difference between a mediocre physics teacher and a phenomenal physics teacher? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think so much of it is in passion mm -hmm. because if they care, they're going to do the work necessary to make sure they know the physics. They're going to have the excitement to share physics with their students. You know, if the teacher doesn't care about physics or, you know, there are people, maybe they major in biology and they're forced to teach physics, but they never become invested in it. That's a problem. But our teachers who maybe major in biology start teaching physics and it turns out, oh, they actually like it and they wanna get more into it. And then those teachers come to our program. They've got the passion, they have the drive, they're great learners. They still, they become great physics teachers. And, and uh, um, to bounce off of that, the, the other thing, um, which is something that we concentrate on, especially that, that makes a great physics teacher is, is someone who realize, who understands that teaching itself is not just you know it's not just trying to get across information mm -hmm. to students it is it, it teaching is an intellectual endeavor in it itself like mm -hmm. figuring out how to teach well is is a puzzle like any other subject mm -hmm. and it is an exciting puzzle to figure out it is ex, it is genuinely fulfilling and exciting to figure out how to teach physics to students better and it's uh and to to when people realize that teaching is about so much more than just you know getting across the physics content but you know what are the strategies am i i'm employing what are the uh you know the skills that i'm having to utilize to reach every student that's that i think makes good teachers yeah. And out. And I, the science, I think, go on. Sorry, on. Yeah, I was going to say the, the science of teaching and learning is fascinating and demanding. And I can tell you, I was not always a physics education researcher. I used to work in the lab with lasers and studying the quantum state of molecules. I think studying physics education is harder. 
Wow. Um, <laughs> it's it's people. Um, people um yeah people. People. Um, so I'm surprised they didn't mention this, but something Robin and um, Will are invested in and have gotten me really highly engaged in is we have we have quite an, an interesting demographic of student that come through the STEM. And believe it or not, we have a lot of males. And that is because at high school level, the sciences, maths, that's perpetuated for, it's, it's okay for boys to like that kind of stuff. I need, Robin needs, we need more females that see their potential that they can go get a physics degree in college because they can do it and become a passionate teacher to inspire more students, whether they're female or male, it's, but we need that. And so often, so that's another reason we need passionate, empowered teachers to inspire all that can be good at physics or biology or math to go on to become teachers because we just need that. And, and we do need the females to see that getting a physics degree is something that they can do, not something that they can't do, that it, it's not just English for them or whatever. Right. So, um, sorry, Melanie. Um, yeah, that, that is um, the topic of one of my other major projects I work on, which is called Step Up. It's a national initiative. Um, it's Florida International University, us, the American Physical Society, and the American Association of Physics Teachers. And we are working in partnership with high school teachers across the country to increase the representation of women in physics. Currently, only about 20% of bachelor's degrees in physics go to women. Wow. Um, but if you put it in the perspective that there are 27,000 physics teachers in this country, and we have all of them chip in a little bit using our research-based strategies, and that there's only 8,000 physics majors anyway, um, high school teachers can make a huge difference. It's shown in the research. If your high school teacher is taking an interest in you to um, say, hey, you can do physics, you should believe in yourself, that's, that's gonna make a huge difference. I love how you described pedagogy or pedagogy. Which one is it? I'll never know. They are both correct. Yeah. Okay. Or just depends on my mood, which one I'll pick then. Right now, I'll say pedagogy. You described it as the science of learning and teaching. Mm -hmm. And I, what I understand from what I know about what you're doing here so far is that pedagogy is a critical part or a defining characteristic about what makes our program so great. What makes that 85% uh, retention factor uh, once they leave. So talk to me a little bit about how you focus on pedagogy, switching it up, uh, in our program and, and what makes what you're doing here at a and Commerce distinct and so effective. And well, I'll just jump in and throw another term at you there is, um, we have a big focus on pedagogical content knowledge, which means that you know how to teach your content. The issues you're gonna face, the pedagogy you need for teaching physics is not the same you need for biology. It's not the same you need for history. So when we're educating our students, we wanna make sure they know how to do it in our context. Okay. Um, and some of that happens over in the physics department and the STEM department, and some of it happens over in Leo Teach. So I will let Melanie jump in and tell you about what, what she does with them over in Leo Teach. Um, same though, it's, you can see it's a true collaboration between the departments. Um, uh, we take what they're learning over there and then um, I um, help them see it through the lens of a variety of grade levels. Um, as crazy as it sounds the first time they hear it, we start with elementary students because that's where they first learn science. Um, and I need more elementary and middle school teachers that are also on fire for it. and so we can inspire and we are inspirational when we come and pack from leo teach to ac williams in commerce and we have the math science days i mean we inspire third fourth and fifth graders they look at us and we are cool but it's in those places that our students can learn to practice their pedagogy so um, i'm an inquiry-based teacher so we learn how to teach using hands-on minds-on type learning and they have to learn that. And you can't lecture to a third grader. And they learn that very quickly that they have to do hands-on, minds-on with third, fourth, and fifth graders. And once they get their hands on that, they realize they can transfer that idea, that knowledge to a high school classroom too. Because they learn that that's more valuable 
when the kids are engaged and, and, and touching it, feeling it, doing it. Um, Cause they are used to rote lecture. We know that at the high school level. So we are trying to make a difference there by letting them go experience it with, we start in elementary, then we go to middle school because these guys will be certified middle school through high school. Um, and then in the last, they finally get to, to go have some fun at a high school. But so we scaffold them, but they practice the pedagogies that each of the respective colleges are providing in my classes by actually going and doing. And then we refine it. We talk about it. Did it work? Did it not? And so they become very reflective practitioners also through this whole process starting in their junior year. Yeah, we, oh, sorry, go ahead, Will. Oh, I, well, maybe you should talk about this, but uh, we, I was just going to mention, we, uh, we introduce this, uh, we introduce, uh, we have a program that introduces students to teaching even earlier um, called the Learning Assistant Program, um, which we put in place about five years ago. Robin, do you want to say? Right. So we have a big emphasis on student-centered active learning environments. Research shows that is the best way to learn. Talking at people isn't learning because it's not memorizing information. It's learning to think critically through things, right? Learn how to solve problems. So what the Learning Assistant Program does is these are undergraduates who help teach classes that they just took so they can take a class one semester and then they help teach it the next semester. <laughs> um, this um, is really a great learning opportunity. Um, you may have heard the phrase, you know, the best way to learn is to teach, and that's very much true. So they certainly learn the content better, better that way. Um, but they're helping to teach the classes, but these are not just undergraduate teaching assistants. Learning assistants take a pedagogy course, and I guess I'm saying pedagogy this time. And this is an hour long seminar that LAs take for every semester that they um, work as LAs in which they, they read education research and they write reflections on their teaching. They form a community with the other LAs and they talk about their challenges and their successes every week and they make each other better teachers. Our teacher in residence that we hired um, through PhysTech is actually teaching that class right now. So they're getting guidance and mentoring from someone who has a great deal of experience teaching high school physics. And they really form a great community. One of my favorite things in seeing the program grow is that the, um, every semester we have about 50% of, of our learning assistants have done it before and 50% are new. And you can see the ones who've been doing it for a while are mentoring the new ones and they're passing down the knowledge. Um, it makes faculties teaching better because they're working with these students. So you have someone to talk about your classes with, someone who's in there with you saying, all right, well, worked well this week. What do we need to work on? And you really see the intellectual challenge in teaching. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's really fulfilling to build this community of all these people who really care about teaching. Mm -hmm. We have over 40 learning assistants now um, right. who are operating in introductory classes in physics, math, biology, and chemistry. So we've sort of expanded this across STEM. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been amazing. Yeah. Talk and to so, me about, go on, Robin. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say we started out um, with just a little department funding um, and doing this with our in our classes for uh, pre service elementary teachers. Then we got support from the Academic Success Center and we expanded into physics. Um, and now we have support from the National Science Foundation in terms of our noise grant. And that's what allowed us to expand across STEM. And the FISTEC grant allowed us to expand. A learning assistance into upper division physics. And now even Will is teaching quantum mechanics in this new student-centered active learning model. Yeah. Wow. So that's that's tremendous growth. How how long has this growth occurred from? When did this start? It's five started. years. Yeah. So oh. it started at the in sort of the seeds began in sort of fall 2014, spring 2015 was when we started putting these things in place. And when did the NSF take note? Um, so we got initial funding in uh, 2016 through 2017. From the NSF, we got a small, essentially they have a startup grant as part of their NOICE fellowship program that allows us to, um, to 
build up our program so that we can reliably recruit and uh, train and graduate physics teachers. So that was in that was 2016, 2017, and that actually allowed us to hire our first teacher in residence, um, which Robin just mentioned. Uh, so a teacher in residence is a work a high school teacher who we hire to work with us to bring in the perspective of high school teachers and help uh, us develop our program in a way that, you know, so that we are addressing all the needs uh, of our students in relation to becoming high school teachers. That's fantastic. I love hearing that there is the active involvement from a current teacher in practice. I think sometimes we can get carried away in our own little worlds, but this seems like a real true collaboration. I mean, the, the three of you are evidence of that across our campus, but then from the community, that's fantastic. And that, that, was, that enabled us to start growing this community of especially rural high school physics teachers. So we, um, over the past four or five years, we've been holding every single semester, we've held a physics day where local high school physics teachers can bring um, their, uh, their students to campus. They get a taste of what physics is. They get shown around a tour of campus. Um, and meanwhile, we take the teachers and we do professional development with them. We talk about physics with them. We have them you know, share ideas with each other and we build up a community because part of the, there's an ad additional problems with teaching physics in a rural context. Uh, you know, rural school districts are small. Uh, rural high school physics teachers are often the only physics teacher. They're often the only STEM teacher. Wow. So they have no one and the only one for miles and miles around. So they're, you know, usually they can't talk or brainstorm solutions to problems with anyone. So um, it's really important to form this community, especially in rural areas where so that that teachers do not feel isolated and can share resources and support. And, and um, so, yeah, that, I think that was a vital uh, part of our growth. The rural component, I think, is, is critical to address. And I'd like to hear you, you all expand a little more on that because uh, for those of you watching who aren't from the commerce area, but rural Northeast Texas is among the most under-resourced place in Texas and, and the nation. The, the challenges that our families face in this region are tremendous. So how does that translate in the impact on STEM and the numbers of you know, students who will go on to STEM career, careers? Um, how likely are they to come to a and Commerce and other universities and pursue STEM. Talk to me about the challenges in rural Texas that are unique and that you're addressing with this program. Um, Melanie, I think you're on the ground with the teachers the most. So why don't you share um, your experiences? Right. Um, so I'm part of the field-based program, um, which means I am involved with their student teaching. Um, and let's just take this semester, um, even the last half of the spring. Um, first of all, we're trying to make a difference with what Robin's talking about, student-centered learning, inquiry-based learning, hands-on, and then you expect us to go virtual. Um, we have, we, we not only have the students at home that are trying to be, you know, the eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th graders that don't have internet, but our own personal students or student teaching struggle because they live in these rural communities, they also don't have their internet. Um, they are living at home with their parents who might have underlying health concerns and things. So they can't go student teach and get that hands-on experience. So, but how we're helping them, um, uh, we're there to support them through giving them, I mean, I meet with my Leo teachers that are student teaching once a week and um, we talk about new technologies that we can try, um, things that they're trying in their classroom, um, all the new, you know, there's all kinds of new tools. And um, so we try them out, we practice them, then they go back to their classrooms and try to practice them. Um, we're learning to be digitally organized. We've been talking about that. Um, so we're supporting them in those ways. Um, 
and we're getting through it. And you know, because I think we are such a strong program, they're pretty creative. Um, we teach them how to be reflective and be creative and, and they're doing it. So now they're supporting their mentor teachers because they're coming from our program. They're like, hey, we learned this new blend space technology. I want to try this with our online. So they're not so scared. They're actually making great contributions to tenured teachers' classrooms that are also brand new, basically for the first time ever, brand new teachers again. So we've got quite a pipeline of undergrads that are working. And so even though AC Williams, it may look different, we don't go face to face, they want us virtually. So we're still going to make a, a difference with those, those teachers that are on the field, that are there, and then the undergrad pre-service teachers, um, we just meet with them and we talk to them about the challenges, but it's the same as all of us. Um, these rural communities were struggling with internet and things like that, but we're finding creative ways to get around it. We are. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I think it's so important that we have all these rural schools as part of our student teaching network. Every university has schools they're partnered with. Um, so say you might, you might get a student teacher who grew up in downtown Dallas, and now you're exposing them to that rural environment when they go out to do their student teaching. Right. That's something new for them. And, you know, there are challenges of being in the rural environment. You can be under-resourced, you can be isolated, but sometimes when they go out there, they also see um, the good things about it because I do. if you go into um, one of the really large school districts, they're often very rigid. They have set curriculum. They don't give you as much freedom. Um, as some of the smaller schools, like you're the science teacher, you have ownership of what you're doing in that district. You have the freedom to try new things. Um, you're part of the community. So there are benefits to being in the rural community. And I never thought about that teacher. part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're small town and they, uh, they get involved with the community. I love to watch our student teachers. They, they actually just get in there and start going to the ball games and, and they become a part of the community and in rural schools. That's huge. And Robin's right on there getting that taste of getting, having some freedom. So I think that's why the creativity is okay because they know they can try things. Um, they're very supported in all of that. And, um, and we've, we've got reflective, we've got a really reflective group of, of folks coming through us that want to be teachers. It makes sense. I'm, I'm a huge Brene Brown fan. I don't know if you all know who she is, um, but uh, she's a social worker, talks about vulner vulnerability, creativity. And I'd never put this connection together, but a rural community like this provides that safety net and family for creativity to really be fostered. And I've never, it took me till this moment to put that together, but I do feel that here in, in this rural community in particular. Um, I have a lot more questions. Some are coming in, if, if I can interject in. Um, someone has one for Dr. Newton. He's currently pursuing a BS in physics with a minor in computer science. I understand that computer science is important in STEM, but will that computer science minor help me get a career? Uh Yes. I mean, so computer science is becoming even more important. And actually in physics education over um, the past decade or so, it's, it's, it's become important enough that there's been nationally, there are several initiatives that have been developed to um, incorporate more computer science and computation into physics. Um, and, uh, and that's something I am you know, particularly interested in. Most of the problems we face in physics can't be solved with pen and paper, right? You have to know how to code. Um, and, and so, and that traditionally hasn't been an integral part of a lot of physics programs. Um, so that is, that's another thing that we're trying to do here is to in, put more and more um, computation into our physics classes. Um, and this is something that we can also uh, extend into the high school uh, and lower levels and emphasize the importance of coding there as well. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Robin can tell you, we, we wrote a grant this summer to uh, try and in, uh, introduce coding activities uh, into a Girl, Sc Girl Scouts archery um, sessions. I love that. We are, um, yeah, that is something we are actively thinking about. Fantastic. Um, another one. Uh, the teacher in residence 
which is the person asking the question, is teaching the LA pedagogy class and running workshops for in-service and pre-service teachers. She's also setting up a mentoring program. Oh, maybe they're just responding um, to another person's questions, um, asking to speak more about the teacher in residence, how that comes into play. Um, but I think you all uh, talked a bit about that. Do you have anything else to add about um, how the teacher in residence is a part of the program and, and this one specifically? Um, he's just made a world of difference in us being able to do all of this. Really running the physics teacher preparation program is a full-time job in and of itself. Before we had him, we were trying to do it on top of the rest of our jobs. Um, but really, I mean, as passionate as we are about physics education, I have not been a high school physics teacher. We really need that perspective in everything that we're planning. And he brings us all that information that we desperately need. Um, so he's, he's just been a wonderful addition to the team. And we get so much more done with his help. Yeah. It's fantastic. But I think the, the insight, and I know we've talked as a university about being more responsive to industry and kind of the, the, the landscape. And I think this is a great example of integrating the landscape into what we're currently doing to make sure it's relevant and effective. Um, at the beginning, you kind of painted a picture about why physics is important. Um, I'm wondering if this program didn't exist and if people don't start really being intentional about recruiting physics teachers, what could happen? Like paint the grim picture of the United States without excellent physics education. What would that look like? Um, well, maybe I can share some information um, from when I was in graduate school. I worked as part of an engineering research center and that's a National Science Foundation program where they bridge between the development of new technologies that physicists do to actually getting that out in industry as a product people can use. And the project I was working on, so I was part of this big project that was worked on ultra fast laser technology. And while my project was more focused on, I love molecules, they're very interesting. I love molecules, they're very interesting. <laughs> but um, there are a lot of people, lasers working at the wavelengths we were working at are important to lithography, which is the process that draws all those really tiny lines on computer chips. Okay. And, and you know how our, our computational devices get smaller and smaller and smaller. So you have to have lasers with smaller and smaller and smaller wavelengths to keep making these things even smaller. Mm -hmm. And the industries have timelines. The industries work with a company that so a lot of the companies are like, all right, we're developing the technology that's coming out in like the next two years, but they collaborate actually on the research that's gonna drive the computer chips smaller for the next 10 years. And so they know what they're doing. The, the industry knows how are we gonna keep making these computers smaller? How are we gonna keep making them faster? And they're using this by connecting the basic physics to the industrial applications. Wow. Now, if we don't have the physicists to do that, we don't have the technology we need to keep doing that and our technological devices are not going to keep getting better. And of course, that's not even accounting for the quantum computing, which is really um, a huge change in how computing can work and physicists are the ones making that happen. I just got a flashback to having to use my giant Nokia phone. So that's what you're right. telling me. If we don't yes. invest, we're going back to those. <laughs> The best case scenario is that other countries have their tiny phones and we're stuck with the giant, you know, 1980s uh, car phones. That, that may be more likely is that other countries are going to be the ones who have the leading scientists we and don't we don't keep investing in it. That's the point. But also you can view it at a finer grain level, bringing it back to um, the importance of doing this in rural areas is that uh, what would be more likely to happen is that the, that the, that advanced industry just gets concentrated in small pockets um, around the country surrounding the most elite universities and rural areas like ours get left behind right mm -hmm. so we could if we don't want that to happen not only do we have to you know nationally pay attention to training physics teachers but we also have to pay attention to the most under-resourced areas mm -hmm. of our country um, and I think that's what especially makes it, uh, makes what 
we do important here is uh, we want to make sure that we that areas like Northeast Texas are get to be a part of the future. So there's research I know, for instance, for our nursing program, that nurses who train in rural areas transition fantastically to urban and rural. But nurses who are trained in urban areas have a really difficult time adjusting to rural areas. Can the same, is there similar research in education about you know, being trained on the front line in rural settings? I think we could I probably- I have not that. seen that research. I haven't seen the research, but I would, I would stand to think that's similar. Um, yeah, you, if, and I, I think they spoke to, we, we service a large area. So I have students who drive in from Fort Worth and I have students who drive in from Mount Pleasant. Um, or van or some other little tiny spot um, more east of here. And um, they, you know, my teachers are graduating. They may have done their student teaching right here around our local university, but they're getting their jobs in Dallas or Fort Worth. And it's not, it's not phasing them. They still feel prepared just the same. That's good to know. So what do you all wish the world knew about physics education? I know this is your, you live and breathe this every single day. For many of us watching, we might for the first time be thinking, huh, I forgot about how important this is. What would you want us to know about this delightful world? Well, that's such a big question. <laughs> so I got into physics education research because Every time I spoke to somebody about what I was doing in school, they would either tell me that they hated physics or that physics was way too hard or their high school physics teacher was terrible. Very rarely did I get anybody saying one nice thing about physics. Right. So, and even then, even if you do enjoy physics in high school, what you're getting is physics that's over a hundred years old, right? There's a lot of exciting new things going on in physics that most people never hear about. Did you know the laser was invented by physicists that LCDs and LEDs and curved televisions are all possible because of physicists? Um, are you interested in like the whole nature of the universe? A lot of people are interested in astronomy. Astronomy is physics. Is. There's a reason physics and astronomy are in the department. Um, so I would love more people to know about all the interesting problems that physicists solve today um, but I'd also like people to know that, yes, physics is hard, but you can do it. What you need is, you know, the drive, um, the interest, the willingness to put in the work and you can do it. And, um, maybe some universities aren't going to support you. I don't know, but like here we take care of you. We meet you where you are and then we take you where you want to be. So we'll, Kitchen. No, we have a tight knit community. Um, some universities aren't willing to meet you where you are. We are. I love that about the Lion family. I think that that's true across the board and, and you especially need that in, in pursuing a degree in physics and physics education. And I was math and they have made math even more fun because they've showed me where it really applies. So uh -huh. they're dragging me over to the dark side what I called it long before I and it's not that anymore it's amazing so it's where math lives and so mm -hmm. it's a really cool connection to watch them in the classes together the biology the math is that all of them together and they complement each other so that's a really cool connection that we make I love that with our kids physics is where math lives I love it that's so <laughs> true what about you Will um I think that uh my the main thing, and I, I I'm touched on this briefly earlier, but the uh, the main thing I would emphasize is that it's not only is physics amazing as a subject, but thinking about how we teach and learn physics is is so much fun and yeah, so big thing, and is not it's not a it's become increasingly evident that it's not a separate thing. It it thinking about how I teach and learn has, I think, genuinely helped me become a better researcher as well, right? Even the, the what 
you would class as non-physics education research. I do um, research in astrophysics and that has benefited from the work I've done in physics education. Um, How so? Tell me a little more about that. Um, it's helped me become a better mentor to uh, my students. Um, it, it's, it's helped me train students better to do research in physics. Um, uh, it has, uh, it has helped me, it's helped me write better papers and give better talks overall. Cause I think more about, you know, what am I actually trying to get across and how am I trying to get it across? Um, and, and that is, you know, and so in research, a large part of success is being able to write convincing papers and give convincing talks, right? And, and that has, this is definitely a place where I have been thinking, you know, stepping back and thinking, what am I saying here? What are, how is my audience going to interpret this, take on board the information? Is there a better way that I could present this information? Um, so it, it's led me to think about a lot more about that. Um, and that's something I really emphasize now to all of my students as, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's teaching and research has ceased to become these two separate spheres, mm -hmm. but they're all one sort of continuous mass of physics. I love as, that. As, yeah, as faculty, our jobs are, you know, we're supposed to fit everything we do into teacher re teaching research and service. I have a very hard time keeping those things mm. separate. Yeah. So they're, they're, all, they're all one. Yes. I, I mean, that's the point of research, right? You're supposed to make a difference. The so what behind all of it? Uh, absolutely. I think it's good that it's blended. And Melanie, you've come over to the dark side recently. My whole family has two, uh, literally into the dark side. We're big fans of the planetarium. Uh, for everyone watching, there's a planetarium in commerce. My four-year-old wants me to ask you when it's open or when she can watch her shows in the planetarium. Do we have an expected deadline or opening I guess we're just waiting and seeing she actually plays planetarium with the remote control at the tv she'll say and now you'll oh. see <laughs> I'll be happy to hear that <laughs> pretty cute adorable uh, um, but I, well, I, but yeah go on Robin we do not run the planetarium um I don't know of their opening plans, but Shree Davis is the one we need to talk yes. about that. She, she's yeah. fantastic I know it's in your building um I have a question uh, about the dark side again. And so, for each of you, I'm wondering when you had that spark, that aha moment, when you thought, this is, I, I want to do this. This, the STEM thing, this physics, um, uh, you know, what did, tell me about that aha moment for you. Or maybe it was Adam. Mo the molecules that when did you fall in love with molecules robin tell me about that <laughs> there you go when did you okay. fall in love with molecules? to hear that as well okay <laughs> well when i was really little i wanted to be a teacher but i was also very interested in science when i was in middle school and such um i remember in high school chemistry my teacher told me that chemical reactions happen so fast that it's impossible to see them happen well guess what if you have fast enough lasers, you can watch it happen. And I learned about this when I was working. I, I started um, studying the interaction of lasers with molecules when I was in college. And um, I took my first quantum class. And, you know, it was interesting. I really enjoyed it. But the section where it connected to the molecules I was studying in my lab, doing the same thing in the lab I was doing outside of class and didn't see anything in class just made me really excited and it's um well you're just asking me to say how big of a nerd are you yes okay That's and I thing. love I love the periodic table we did um a project in eighth grade where we we like discovered the periodic table with these little funny people and I saw like how the periodic table is such a great success of science and how all these different ideas come together. And then you see the periodic table working when you study how molecules come together. And so that fit in with my love there. And then I think, yeah, somewhere around my senior year of college, I discovered the field of ultra fast 
optics in which you can watch molecules do all of their very fast things. And I discovered I could prove my chemistry teacher wrong. So that got me really excited. Have you followed back up with your chemistry teacher about that? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> That's the link to this live video. Right? <laughs> oh, no, that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 so my first love was math. Um, right. And uh, as, as a, uh, you know, where I was one of those kids who when you know you were learning the times tables I wouldn't I wanted to like see how high I could go um and uh and then I got into astronomy um and astronomy was my second love um mm. and uh I really didn't like physics until the last two years of high school mm. and uh it was only in the last two years that I fit and and I think it really coincided with when when you could combine a lot of the math that I knew with physics, that was when I saw it, everything started to click. And I also started reading, this ties into what uh, Robin was saying about how a lot of high school physics is, um, is uh, you know, essentially physics that was discovered over a hundred years ago. When I started reading about um, recent discoveries in physics and saw that physics was also, you know, this weird, stuff like quantum mechanics and um and uh, relativity that's when i started really getting excited um and i would also like to add that um the stories will and i are telling are those of the typical physicist of the people who are already doing physics of that very small group of eight thousand people i don't want physicists to just be people like us there's lots of interesting things you can do with physics that i'm sure i haven't even thought of yet and you know, I don't want anybody to feel like they need to have been the person who was always interested in math or the person who's always interested in science to become a successful physicist. You may not discover you like physics until you're like 30 years old. You can still be a great physicist. In fact, I, I would like to just highlight one of my students who, um, he was a, uh, he had a degree in graphic design and he was working in graphic design, but he decided to come back to college to do physics because it was his dream to work at NASA. And he's now done two internships at NASA and did a program with NASA during the school year. And, you know, he, he didn't come to physics until I think sometime in his mid twenties. Um, we've had students who don't come to physics till they're over 40, you know? So these are our stories, but don't, don't let that keep you. From, right. from physics. Yeah. That, the physics thing for me is their fault. That's all these two. I, I came to them as a math person and and, and that's what I knew myself as, but math came easy, sort of. And it took a teacher to say that that was okay, that it came easy to me before I really fully accepted that that was fine. But it was a college professor. That was traditional high school math, but it was a college professor that helped me see where pi comes from. Is That's when I realized that there was a why to every math. And then that, put me on a different path. And then I met these guys and I was like, oh my gosh, this is where the math is. I mean, it's more of the why, why do we use it? Why are patterns and functions and things so cool? Um, so we offer the best of both worlds here by letting them see that in each other, that math folks have a, have a gift and science folks have a gift. And there's a, there's a way for them to work together and, and put those together. So yeah, the physics thing for me, I'm, I'm old. I won't say how um, but it's their fault. So that was in the last three years that I saw the beauty of physics. Well, thank you, Robin and Lynn, for bringing Melanie uh, along for the beauty of physics. <laughs> um, paint a picture for me. So uh, this has already gotten uh, received, you know, obviously, NSF attention and global recognition. Say this really works and people take note about the pedagogical influence and what you're doing and the um, this 85% retention rate of physics teachers after they graduate and everyone starts doing this and suddenly we have amazing physics teachers around the nation. What changes? Tell me what's, what's going to be look different. Well, one thing I would really love to look different is the face of who's developing new technology and 
who's inventing new things, who's studying these new and making these new scientific breakthroughs. Right now, that if you look in the news, you're going to see a lot of white men. And there are people who are not white men who are doing great work and are not getting credit. Um, but if we're going to grow our numbers, I want to grow our diversity. Mm -hmm. There are there's so much more talent in our country than is getting the opportunity to show us what what they have to bring. And I I want perspectives that are not mine. Mm -hmm. And I think that is absolutely crucial to creativity and innovation, right? I mean, ultimately, you want not only the physics expertise, but you want it in the hands of as many different people as possible, yep. um, because that drives innovation and creativity. We, I yep. see it in, in research groups all the, all the time that if you're, you know, if, if if you have a diverse uh, group of people with the expertise who are coming at it from many different perspectives, throwing out many different ideas, you are just going to come up with better ideas overall. Yeah, there, there are times in scientific history, I think if you look at the development of quantum, it was this mm -hmm. small group of people, they got them all together in one, one picture. They missed some important points that um, nobody cared to pay attention to until decades later. Yeah. I think that's something Will loves to talk about. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, we need those broader perspectives. You'll see that in, um, like, a, especially in medical research, you'll see that um, medical research doesn't get applied to everybody if people are only paying attention to people that look like them. Um, and that's, that's a problem in all of science. Mm -hmm. So I think that the bottom line is that if you get, you know, if we train, a, you know, a lot of excellent physics teachers and get physics expertise in the hands of a large and diverse group of people, then uh, the end result is we, you know, come up with the best ideas and the best technology. Um, and uh, yeah. The, yeah, the, technology that's good for everybody. That is good for everyone and that benefits us all, yeah. You know, we need to empower this generation of, of kids and, and people across the nation. Um, they need to see that they can. And the only way that that's where it begins is in high school. It's the, the years that you begin to really remember. So if we begin at the high school physics teachers and STEM teachers, we empower a nation full of kids or globe. And maybe, you know, maybe there's environmental issues or something that's specifically impacting the area where those kids grew up. They become mm -hmm. scientists. They're, yep. they're ready to solve the problems because they, they have that personal connection to it. Yep. That's a really good point. We, ha we have another question. I'm going to blend it with um, one that I've been thinking about. Um, when we see someone who is having one of these moments like you when you were following and following falling in love with molecules, or you see that spark of inspiration, you see someone who may go into STEM, or you know someone who definitely wants a career in physics. What are some of the extracurricular activities or how should we foster that or encourage that so that it can grow and blossom um, kind of on the large scale? Well, that's kind of a broad question and different people have access to different resources. Um, like Girl Scouts mm -hmm. um, is a great one for Northeast Texas where um, we've been working with Girl Scouts in Northeast Texas in particular. They have a STEM center near downtown Dallas, mm -hmm. um, but they don't just serve the urban area. They serve the entire Northeast Texas region. Hey, speaking of children. Um, <laughs> So, sorry, I'm distracted by my child. You don't have to um, say so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Girl Scouts, so, downtown Dallas. Yeah, so they, they, I think they have a place where they, they do, they have biomedical research, they have telescopes, they have geology trails, they have so much in terms of science for, uh, for girls to do out there. Um, they have field trips for all sorts of school groups too. Um, there's another organization I volunteered for called Design Connect Create, and they do summer camps for girls who are about to take their first high school physics class in high school. And that's really important because though girls are just as good at physics as boys are, they don't 
feel like it. Right. And so we need um, to make sure we intervene and give girls the confidence to go forward in doing physics. It's really important to recognize and make sure they know that we see them as physics people because broader society may not be mean to, but broader society is telling them that they don't belong in physics. And so whatever our extracurricular activities are, whatever resources we can get them access to, we have to make sure they see physics as something that's for them. Fantastic. And that's, that's Lana. Physics is for Hi, her Lana. too. <laughs> Do you all have other uh, activities that you'd recommend? Hopefully we will um, create a generation of teachers who do after school and have, you know, work with their local, local communities to have these camps too. Well, they will see us doing it and then they will have that ability and that knowledge to take with them to do startup around their own schools. Um, I know some are now, um, they're doing math clubs and science clubs because they were part of ours and they're so on fire for it. They go to their local school. So if we can just one school at a time, get that going. Um, and we will, we encourage it. Um, yeah. They bring the students in, um, these LAs help plan these things. So they are part of the workshop. So because we train them in that thinking, they go forward and, and multiply with those programs. Yeah, I mean, we have physics day, I know there are, math activities at AM Commerce. There's all sorts of opportunities at AM Commerce um, for a full age range, and Karen being one of them, of course. Um, right. So we have opportunities and we're we're always happy to work with local teachers on whatever exposure what they, want they want for their students. Fantastic. Will do you have any other thoughts you wanted to add before I wrap up for the day? Uh I can't think of anything. We've covered most stuff oh have uh, i forgotten to ask you all anything have, that you want to make sure people know I remember if we've talked about our online masters no please tell us <laughs> that because that that's a major thing that we did and we uh have uh started in the last few years um we have a uh we started a master's program to support the uh it was specifically aimed at the um the sort of 50 plus percent of teachers of high school physics teachers who don't have a degree in physics because we want to not only concentrate on preparing new uh, well-trained physics teachers but we also want to support the teachers who are already teaching physics but don't have the background in physics but want to have that passion have fallen in love with physics because they've been asked to teach the physics class because no one else will and so we started a completely online master's program um, for high school teachers. Um, and uh, we, it's the only one of its kind in this country. Um, there is no other master's program that blends um, high level physics content with pedagogical uh, content knowledge. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. We have uh, this, this started about five years ago and we have so far graduated about uh, 60 or so uh, teachers who have come through our program. Um, and we currently have well over 60 teachers enrolled in our program at the moment. Um, and the exciting thing is about half of them are local, um, Northeast Texas, or at least the state of Texas, but about half of them come from all over the country wow. because it's no geographical restrictions so um, we're able to reach out and support teachers all over the country and what's particularly exciting and I and I think we should um, although she can't be here give a big shout out to Dr. Bahar Madia who is the uh, other absolutely crucial member of our team um, she has done been researching these online classes and and uh, and show how we've managed to build a, a national community of teachers through these classes. Um, so we have teachers in rural Northeast Texas discussing how to teach physics and uh, the problems that they have with teachers in uh, Massachusetts or teachers in Arizona. And so we're, we're getting uh, a huge, a lot of perspectives 
on teaching from all over the uh, from all of the uh, country um, coming together. So which That's is fantastic. See, yeah, and um, one way we'd like to build on that is we'd like to build an online community that exists outside of our classes so our students that graduate can stay in our online community and we can keep them connected mm -hmm. um, because when we have reflective teachers that can help each other out and support each other that's good for everyone absolutely i love that oh and i would also add we also just added a, another track in that program where people can become certified to be physics and math teachers mm -hmm. You all are doing a lot of great work that's certainly impactful, um, not only here, but uh, across the nation and, and globe. And I, I just can't thank you enough for being here at Commerce and educating rural East Texans and all over the country with this master's program online. That's fantastic. You are really inspiring so many young minds into going into, going into a field that's critical for all of our well-being. And so thank you so much for what you do. Does anyone have any closing comments or anything I forgot to ask that you think is essential before we wrap up? I think we could, we covered it all. <laughs> well, I learned a lot today. I really, really did. And um, I'm excited to see how this program continues to grow and we'll stay in touch and spread the word. And um, if anyone has questions about the master's program, certainly contact us at AM Commerce and we'll put you in touch with these find people on the screen. So with that, I'll say go Lions and y'all have a wonderful afternoon. Stay creative. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, I think I ended it, so we're good.